Good afternoon, fellow travelers. My name is William Clark. I have been on this expeditionary uh, excursion for well over two years now, and I'm waiting here at the conjunction of the Missouri and Yellowstone Rivers for my friend Meriwether Lewis to join us. We set out, it seems like forever ago, from St. Louis, Missouri in 1803, and we traveled up the Missouri River in a very, very difficult way, all the way up to the people of the Hadassah. And we wintered there from 1803 to 1804 at a place we called Fort Mandan. We had built that. Now, I want to tell you that our purpose was to explore the newly purchased Louisiana Territory. This is something that President Jefferson had set to originally just buy the city of New Orleans so that he could secure American goods to travel down the Mississippi River and go all the way into the Gulf and therefore enter into worldwide markets. But we had to have New Orleans be free to our trade and our travel. So he had talked to Napoleon Bonaparte, the emperor of the French, and offered to buy the city from him. Napoleon instead tells him another plan, something that totally shocked President Jefferson and the rest of the United States. He wanted to sell us not only New Orleans, but the entire Louisiana Territory, which was millions and millions of acres and, and hundreds of thousands of square miles for the sum of $15 million. Now, President Jefferson was troubled because he did not feel initially that he had the constitutional authority to purchase the Louisiana Territory. And eventually, however, with his friend, Mr. Madison, they came around and decided to go forward with the treaty that ensured that the United States would double in size without a single drop of blood being shed, without any sort of battle or war or conquest. And so he was able, through the Louisiana Purchase, to double the size of the United States Territory. However, that was a very large territory that we really knew very little about, and so he sent me and my friend Meriwether Lewis on an exploration excursion, as I said. We were called the Corps of Discovery, and we were a military outfit. Uh, captain Lewis was, in fact, a United States Army captain. I was only a lieutenant, but he insisted upon calling me captain, and we shared co-equal status in leadership of the expedition. And so when we left St. Louis, we had several important things that we were ordered to do. Number one, we were to meet and act as diplomats to new Native Americans that we would meet along the way. We were under very strict orders not to get into any, any sort of violent altercation with any of the natives that we met. Instead, we were to open uh, trade. We were to let them know that the United States and the Great Father in Washington City would now be the power who would see oversee this territory. We were to gather scientific and, and, and other type of information. You have to remember, this is the core of discovery. This is an enlightenment effort. And so we had to find out everything we could about the different plants, the different animals, and all the things that might be new information that we could share with the world from our exploration. We also needed to make a lot of maps because again, we're going into a part of uh, American territory that no white man had ever set foot in and very little was known about it. We wanted to know where the mountains were. We wanted to know where the rivers were. We wanted to know where the fertile soil was. And so one of our main jobs was also to make maps and get this information and at the end of our expedition, get it back into uh, Washington City, the capital of the United States, and eventually publish this work so that the information would be not available, available not just to Americans, but to the entire world. This is what the Enlightenment is about, and it's important to remember that this is our goal. We're not there yet. As I said, I'm waiting on Captain Lewis to join me here, but from here down the Missouri, it will be a very, very short trip because we'll be traveling along with the flow of the water. And that's why I said when we initially started out from St. Louis two and a half years ago, it was a very difficult trip because we were moving against the flow of the water and we were having to take all of our supplies with us on, on a large keel boat. So this boat is in the river and loaded with tons and tons of supplies, but we can't drift down river with the, with the flow we're having to go against it. So the men of the expedition, 37 in total, 
are on either side of the stream with ropes, literally pulling and pulling that kill boat along. And we're making very, very slow progress until we got to Fort Mandan, as I said, in the winter of 1803 and 1804. We sent a last batch of letters back down the Missouri River so that they could reach President Jefferson. And then we sat out from that point. We met some very interesting people along the way. One of the people we met was Toussaint Charbonneau. We had hired him to be a translator. We knew we would be going into territory that we had never seen and meeting different types of people who would not speak our language, our language, of course, being English. And we needed someone who would be able to help us communicate with them. He asked permission to bring along his wife, Sakagawea, and at first, Captain Lewis and I were very unsure as to whether we would let a woman come on this expedition. We knew it was going to be tough going. We knew that it would take a lot of physical exertion. We would be sleeping out of doors the entire time. The food might get short. Everyone was literally and figuratively going to have to pull their weight. But we assented, and as it turned out, this was a very good thing because she was actually a much, much better diplomat and a much, much better translator than her husband Toussaint. I want you to imagine how difficult it was to communicate with these Native American tribes. I or Captain Lewis would have to say something to Toussaint Charbonneau. He spoke English and we would say, for example, we need to buy horses. We would say this to Toussaint in English. English would turn around to his wife, Sakagawea, and in French say, we need to buy some horses. She would then turn to someone as she spoke French, Shoshone, and Hidatsa, she would speak to someone who spoke Hidatsa or Shoshone and say, in those languages, we need to buy horses. Then that person would talk to the Native American tribe leaders, perhaps the Sioux, who would say, ah, you need to buy horses. Well, we have three horses for sale. And then the process would have to reverse. He would have to say it in Hidatsa and Shoshone to uh, a, an intermediary. They would say it to Sakagawea in that language, she would turn around and in French say, we have three horses to Toussaint. And then Toussaint in English would say, they have three horses for sale. This took a very long time, but it was absolutely necessary so that we could secure supplies, so that we could open relationships with all of these different tribes and nations. And as a result, Sakagawea became very important. And even though at first we thought she would be a burden to us, it turns out she was able to pull her own weight, and she even gave birth to a son, Jean-Baptiste, on the way during this expedition. So she was a remarkable person. We continued going west, making maps, taking records of all the plants, all the different animals that we found, and writing them down in our journals. You have to remember the journals are a very important part of what we're going to do. This is how we record things. Uh, if we want to if we want to put in the journals how something looked, we have to draw a picture. Uh, if we want to describe the plant, we have to write it in our journals. So those journals become the centerpiece of the entire core of discovery. Now, as we continued to make our way, we would run into all sorts of animals we'd never seen before. There were giant grizzly bears, uh, as easily as big as a buffalo, and they would sometimes chase us. We would have to, to run. We, we knew that our weapons could not necessarily hurt a grizzly bear, so we tried to avoid them as much as possible. And eventually, we got to the Pacific Ocean in November of 1804, and it was a sight to see. We realized that we had traveled over 3,000 miles, and it had taken us a great deal of time. Now, I'm not talking about 3,000 from St. Louis, where we began the expedition, but of course, we had to begin in Virginia and Pennsylvania when we were purchasing supplies, when we were gathering the types of information we would need for this journey. And we had to travel from that point to St. Louis and then from St. Louis begin the expedition to the Pacific Ocean. One of the things we were looking for was the rumored Northwest Passage. We had hoped, we'd heard rumor that there would be a waterway that went from the Pacific Ocean all the way to the Mississippi because you have to remember Waterways are the ways in which we travel the fastest and the best, and we hope that we would have a pathway that goes all the way from the Mississippi, the father of waters, to the Pacific Ocean. But alas, we have not found anything like that yet. We wintered 
uh, next to the Pacific Ocean at the Columbia River between 1804 and 1805, and then we began our journey back. Now, the journey back took us much less time so far because we've been able to go along rivers and travel along waterways going with the flow of water. This is so much easier. But we're also having to hunt for our own food. One of the one of my main jobs with the expedition was to handle the supplies, to make sure that the boats get up and down the rivers where they need to be, to handle the logistics, setting up camp, making sure there's plenty of food. And that is why I have my weapon. We went into the territory. Again, we were a military expedition with military weapons, but we did not go to fight. We went uh, to make peace, but we still are going to carry weapons with us. First of all, to defend ourselves if we got into a bad situation, but also primarily as a way to hunt for meat. So deer and elk uh, and antelope and sometimes buffalo, we would use these weapons, these uh, state-of-the-art flintlock weapons to hunt down meat and that would help us sustain ourselves in terms of food. We also had uh, something called dried soup. This was something that Captain Lewis discovered and he bought a great deal of it. It was, if you can imagine, someone had has made soup uh, and then they had taken all the water out of it. They had dried it up and it turns into this cakey powder that could be stored in chests or in barrels. And when it's time to eat it, you would simply take out a scoop and put it into hot water and it would turn into a kind of soup, not necessarily uh, delicious, but certainly sustaining. And Captain Lewis bought tons and tons of this. And we, it, we had so much that sometimes we would bury it along the way to the Pacific Ocean so that when we came back, we knew those supplies would be there. So let me, uh, I'm going to set my rifle down to the side for just a moment. I want to show you some of the tools that I've used to do some of the mapping and some of the negotiations. Now, the, the clothing that I have on, uh, this is just a, a jean cloth uh, overfrock. This is something that's very durable. It can keep uh, the weather out. It can keep me warm if it's cold. It can keep the rain off of me because you have to remember we're not even really bringing tents with us. We're going to sleep out under the stars when we haven't built a fort to winter in during the cold months. I have a belt, I have a knife here with me that I can use not necessarily to fight with, but as for camp chores and things like that. Uh, I have here the, the things I need to fire my weapon. I have a powder horn uh, to keep the gunpowder in. The horn keeps the powder dry. I have a, a small hatchet here attached to the bag so that, again, not necessarily to fight with, but to do chores and things around the camp, Ch uh, uh, chop firewood, things like that. And the pouch has the lead balls that I'll use for the, uh, for the rifle. Here in my bag, uh, these are sort of the, my day-to-day -day tools of the trade. So, first of all, I have this journal. I want to show you the inside of the journal. Um, you see, it's just a very basic journal. It has different uh, pages inside. Uh, some of them are still blank, but I filled up many of these journals with information and with drawings. Uh, and in the back of the journal, I have some tools here. I have a, a, a small lead pencil. I have some scissors. And I have a little magnifying glass, all tucked away inside my journal. Because as we go along, again, when we find an interesting plant that we've never seen before, or we see an interesting animal we haven't seen before, we're going to stop and we're going to take notes about that. We may take some clippings of the, of the particular kinds of bushes or trees that may be of use to us later, and we'll, we'll take those, we'll take them back to camp at night, and we will make uh, drawings, good drawings, of what we found. We will write very, very detailed descriptions in all of our journals so that we'll know what we found. Again, we're keeping that scientific record. Now, Captain Lewis was primarily the one taking care of all the scientific research and all the scientific writing. As I said, my job was hunting, my job was making sure all the supplies and the camps were set up, and making maps. So I carry this very, very special compass. Now, this compass, you know, all compasses point north. So this compass does point north, but I don't know if you can see uh, very small details, there are numbers that go around the edge of the compass. Most of you have learned in school that a circle has 360 degrees, so the compass shows 360 degrees. So what I can do is turn this into a small 
surveying compass. In my pocket, a surveyor usually will have a big tripod, they'll have a big compass and it'll take several men, but if I can go up, say, to the, to the hill behind me and get a broad look all around the territory, I'll be able to look through these sight veins. You can see here and here, these little brass sight veins, and I can look through that and get my bearings and see where the needle sits on the compass, and I can write that down. Well, the mountain that I want to map is over there, and the river is over here, and I can write down precisely and specifically the direction those are. And then I can write that information in my journal, and then when I get back to camp, while Captain Lewis is writing down his information about his plants or animals, I'll be able to make a map, a map like this. So this is uh, a part of the Missouri River. This is called a portage because sometimes the river is too shallow to move a boat. So what will happen is you'll have to bring your boat to this point here and then unload it and carry all the equipment back down to a point in the river where it's deep enough for the boat to go and then it can continue on. So maps like this become very, very important if we want people to come back to this land and settle it. They'll know where they'll need to set up their towns, they'll know where they're going to be able to get fresh water, they'll know where the rivers are deep enough or not deep enough to be used to bring goods back and forth on, on boats. Now, I also have something special. We brought several of these with us in our relations with the Indian tribes. These are called peace medals. And this peace medal in particular is, is from Thomas Jefferson. And you can see that it's uh, an image of Thomas Jefferson, and it says that he is President of the United States. And we would give these to the different leaders of the tribes. And on the back, you see it as two hands clasped in friendship with a peace pipe above it. And it says even there, it says peace and friendship on the back of the medal. And so we would give these medals to the different tribal leaders so they know they would know that we had been by they would be seen as having some of that great magic as a gift from some of the people from the great father in Washington and part of what we're bringing back to in this little box this is the perfect sort of thing Mr. Jefferson encouraged us to do and this is something that is very very scientific and could be of great benefit in this very small box I'm going to show you what's in the small box It's a bean. It's simply a bean. It's a, it's, a, it's a small batch of beans that the Hadatsa were kind enough to give us. They have these amazing plant varieties that we've never seen before, and these are, these are delicious beans, and they're, and they're very fruitful, and, and the beans grow excellently. So we've also gathered as much as we can of some of the, the Indian tribe's food sources and their, and their, uh, their corn, some of their squash, some of their beans, and we're taking those seeds back with us because Mr. Jefferson will absolutely love the ability to, to look at these and to grow them. And you have to imagine that this is an absolutely fascinating thing for those of us who are interested in agriculture, for those of us who are interested in ways that we can make, it, make life better for everyone. If we can find crops that work here in the Louisiana Purchase, then the people who come here to settle, of course, are going to already have the ability to plant crops that we know will do well and it will help to sustain them. Now, we've gotten here, as I said, to the uh, confluence of the Missouri and Yellowstone rivers. This is an absolutely beautiful land um, and all the land we've seen is so beautiful and the land we've, we've seen, remember, there's, there are no white people here. We've seen many, many Indians, but there are no large cities. There are no big farms. This is absolute wilderness, untouched and pristine and beautiful. And hopefully, as, as the years go by, we will be able to improve this land and, and farm it and make it fruitful, but we'll also remember to maintain the land so that it can continue to be a benefit to all of those who come after us. Now, I have talked a great deal about uh, what has happened so far on the uh, Corps of Discovery expedition, but since you were kind enough to come to our camp here, in the, at the Yellowstone River, I would like to open it up to questions for some of you who may be interested to hear some of the stories that we've had. Carrie wants to know, what kind of new animals did you discover? Uh, Carrie would like to know what sort of animals we discovered, new animals. Well, let me begin by saying, uh, Mr. Jefferson doesn't know this yet. He'll be very disappointed, but we did not find 
any mammoths. He was sure that out here in the west uh, we would be able to find some of these. There were some large uh, new uh, antelopes. We had seen antelopes before, but these are a completely new and different variety. They're so much larger, so much bigger. We found several different new kinds of fish, and we found several different new kinds of bug. Now, Mr. Lewis was far more interested in the bugs than I was. Some of the bugs were merely nuisances. Um, but some of the uh, but some of the game was just absolutely remarkable, and and all of it was significantly larger and usually significantly faster than the type of animal we see in the eastern part of the United States. Again, because this land has not been settled by white people yet, so we have a very very pristine type of of, uh, of animal life and plant life that I hope continues to be. Catch people up just joining. Where is Lewis? Ah, yes. Yeah, some uh, so folks who may have just uh, come and, and join us. Lewis is not here right now. Lewis, uh, went, just before we decided to cross the Continental Divide, Lewis needed to go explore one of the rivers. Um, I believe he called it the the Marissa or the, the Mansa. I can't remember exactly. Uh, he he was on one of his maps. He was very interested in it as a potential waterway, and he was also going to meet with some of the Blackfeet crow in that area. Uh, he sent me along further to the south to meet one of the other native tribes here. And we were supposed to meet here where the Yellowstone and the Missouri come together. He's not here yet. I, I'm, I'm going to guess that he's not going to be able to join us today. Uh, they may still be a couple of days away, but the good news is once he does arrive, we'll be able to put all of our goods onto a boat and float down the Missouri River. I guess we'll be back in St. Louis probably in one to two weeks. And the expedition will be over. And I'm not sure what I'll do with myself. I've been on an adventure that's indescribable for the last two and a half years. And it'll be very difficult to go back to sitting behind a desk and, and writing letters and, and trying to worry about sums and mathematics and things like that. We'll see how that goes. Did you have any pets along the expedition? Uh, did we have any pets along the expedition? I think uh, someone brought a dog uh, with us. And, and interestingly enough, uh, I, don't, I didn't see the dog after the first little bit, but the Indian tribes also had dogs, and sometimes we would get the dogs to come with us. So, so uh, we didn't actually say we're going to take a pet with us on the expedition. But who doesn't love a dog? And so when the dog would come along with us, and I, I think one of the soldiers traded for the dog with one of the native tribes, and he followed us for quite some time. Uh, we want to know, how old are you on this expedition? So I was born in August of 1770, and uh, I served in the, in the Army when I grow old, grew older, and at 26 I retired from the Army, if you can believe it, because of poor health. Uh, but let's see, I, I, it's not very often someone asks how old I am, so I am about 33 or 34 years old right now. Um, so I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the prime of my life. Uh, I have a, a lot to do still yet. But some of the adventures I've had, again, I was with the Army. Um, my family, uh, I was born in Virginia, which is where my family lived. But shortly thereafter, all of us moved to Kentucky. And I mostly grew up in Kentucky uh, and participated in some of the military actions there against some of the Indian tribes. And it was during the time in the Army that Lewis and I met, and we became fast friends. And he decided that if anyone could go on this expedition that Mr. Jefferson had set him to, it was going to be me. And where did you go to school? What was your education like? I did not go uh, to, to, uh, to a school. I was schooled at home. Uh, I realized the value of an education, certainly, and, and I was taught by... Um, my parents, I did go to a, a very formal school when I was very young and learned some of the basic reading and writing. Um, but I was mostly self-taught, and I was mostly uh, able to learn from those around me. When you're made a, an officer in the U.S. Army, you have to learn things very quickly. And some of the boring things, like filling out reports and, and requisitions and things like that, can be very monotonous, but it also teaches you how to organize your thoughts, how to organize your writing, and that has certainly come in very handy on this expedition. Rebecca wants to know if anyone died during the expedition. Uh, Rebecca, that's a good question. Did anyone die on this expedition? As far as the members of the expedition go, we only had one loss of life, and that was we were not very far into the expedition. It was during the first year, and 
he, uh, he did not die. It was one of our sergeants, and he did not die from anything violent. He had an, an inflammation of his bowels of some sort. Um, I believe the doctors now uh, call that appendicitis. It seems to be a, a bad case of appendicitis. No one on the expedition was a doctor, much less a surgeon, so we could unfortunately do nothing for him. And he died from that inflammation. But that is the only loss of life uh, among those on the expedition. Lisa, uh, sorry, Jake and Grant want to know, what did you eat along the trip? Uh, Jake and Grant would like to know what I ate on this trip. A little bit of everything, Jake and Grant. Um, when we first started out, our supplies, as I said, consisted of some of that dried soup. Uh, the whole time on the expedition, we were hunting game with our rifles. We would shoot antelope and deer and buffalo and keep that meat. So it was a very meat-heavy diet. Uh, we would bring things like flour. We would bring things like meal. Um, and we would also trade with the Indian tribe. So we would go, and that was the only way. We were able to get any sort of fresh vegetables uh, for our meals. And, and what we had was a lot of trade goods. A lot of what we brought with us was actually intended to trade with the Native Americans. We had beads, uh, we had ribbons, we had some firearms, we had some cloth, uh, we had a lot of different things like that. The metals, the peace metals that I showed you before were a very valuable trade item. So we brought those items knowing that we would have to trade for food and for horses. When we left St. Louis, we didn't have a single horse amongst us. We were going to depend upon the river, which we were also able to fish out of, by the way, to move us. And once we started heading overland, we knew we would have to trade for horses. And this is where Sacagawea came in such use because otherwise we would have had to walk across the entire continent as it was. We were still mostly walking, but we did not have to carry our supplies. We got those horses mostly to carry the heavy weights for us. We have a few questions about Sacagawea. One, how old was she? How old was Sacagawea? We're not exactly sure. She was very young. Uh, she couldn't have been much more than 20 when she came on uh, this journey with us. Uh, she was very young. I believe uh, Tucson and she had just become a couple not very long before. We've heard her name pronounced differently. Why do you pronounce it the way you do? Uh, because when I heard her talking, that's how I heard it. And you can look through my journals. While I am self-educated, I'm perhaps not very well educated. And I will admit that when you go back through my journals, I may have spelled it three or four or five different ways, uh, but there's always a, a, a G in there, a hard G, Sacagawea. That's what we heard, and when we, uh, remember we spent an entire winter with a Hadatsa, and we heard her name very, very frequently. And so, at, having known her, having listened to the language, having had conversations with her around the fire at night, Sacagawea or Sacagawea is certainly the way we pronounce it. How did Sacagawea manage taking care of a newborn on such a treacherous journey? <laughs> they want to know how she took care of a newborn on a treacherous journey. I'm going to write that up to the amazing power of women and of motherhood. Um, as I said, I thought this was something that would slow us down. And she was, uh, when she went into labor, she was very ill. And it was recommended uh, that she eat, or excuse me, drink a potion made of a rattlesnake rattle. And we were willing to try anything. So was her husband, who was very afraid for her life. We gave her this potion of, of uh, roots and rattlesnake rattle ground up. And a few days later, she gave birth to a very healthy boy. And she carried that child and nursed that child all along the way. And he stayed with us uh, until they parted from us. Um, I, I'm trying to remember exactly how many months they were with us. It was a long time. They wintered uh, over 1804 and 1805 with us uh, on the banks of the Columbia River. And it's just, it's amazing to me. Uh, she did not ask for that much help from anyone. She was a very, very strong woman and I greatly admire her. How many people were on the expedition? So there were 37 men on the expedition. Uh, all of them were soldiers. There was Captain Lewis, there was myself, uh, we had uh, three sergeants, uh, some corporals, and some privates. And again, this was this, even though this was a military expedition, it was not a, a war expedition, but you need that sort of training, you need that sort of discipline to go along when you're going to be gone for so long, and we need people that can take orders and get done what needs to be done. We brought along with us eventually about four or five civilians like Toussaint and Sacagawea, but it was not a very large 
expedition. So at the, at the most, it was about 40 people uh, moving through, but that's still 40 people that have to eat at least twice a day. So that's still a lot of supplies. John would like to know if you can tell us about Big Nose George. I don't know. I cannot remember a Big Nosed George. Okay. I, I do apologize. Okay, but easy stories. Uh, how about a grizzly story? Oh, we have a couple of grizzly stories. I'm going to, I'm, I don't want to embarrass myself. I'll tell the one about uh, Captain Lewis. Captain Lewis was out hunting uh, near a river, and he uh, had seen a deer on the other side, and so he had brought his rifle up to take aim. And as he told it, he said that he could feel something or someone looking at him or watching him. So he turned back this way, and only a few feet away was a gigantic grizzly bear. Well, this grizzly bear immediately began running towards him and chasing him. He threw his rifle down and ran as fast as he could into the middle of the stream, hoping that that would keep the bear from coming on to get him. And apparently it did. He's, uh, he's out there in the middle of the river just floating and, and flopping for all of his worth, and the bear's sitting there on the, on the side of the riverbank, and eventually the bear goes away. So out comes Captain Lewis, humiliated, soaking wet. Um, his rifle's all scuffed up from being tossed on the ground, and he finally makes his way back to camp and tells us the story. I can tell you that, that we did poke fun of him at that. <laughs> uh, were you trained in illustration or to make your drawings? Um, was I trained uh, to illustrate and do my drawings? Honestly, I was not. I, um, now, Captain Lewis had gone and met some of the preeminent scientists of the day before the expedition. He had gone to see Benjamin Russ, Rush, excuse me, uh, a doctor. He had gone to see David Rittenhouse, who was an excellent uh, cartographer and astronomer and surveyor. And he had gotten some of this training. I myself most of my training came from when I was in the Army. And, and to be honest, most of the drawing that I was going to do was going to be of those maps, like that map that I showed you. So not a lot of artistry is involved, but it's more being as precise as you can in the measurements and in the directions that the compass shows you. So having the compass is a very good and, and useful tool to use when I'm making those maps. But neither one of us had had any formal training as an artist or as an illustrator. Helen would like to know, is it true that you caught a prairie dog and put it in a cage and sent it to Jefferson? <laughs> uh, that, that is not true because a prairie dog is not going to go very well in a cage. Someone had asked if, if we had captured, a, for example, a prairie dog and put it in a cage and sent it to, sent it to President Jefferson. Not really. We, we'd, we knew that, that those live animals would not make the journey. Now, what we did is we would take the animals and, and usually kill them and usually eat the meat. And then we would render the animals, we would skin them, uh, we would uh, you know, take out uh, the, the bowels and things like that that would not be healthy, and we would take the bones and the skins and put them in a package and either send those to the president or leave them somewhere so that we could get them on the way back. We did this with a large buffalo, we did this with a grizzly bear, we did this with some of the smaller animals, but we did not send or take with us any live animals. There was just there, was, there were too many issues involved in trying to accomplish that. Leslie wants to know, how big were the forts that you wintered in? Ah, uh, the question is, how big were the forts that we wintered in? They were not very big. Uh, Fort Mandant, because we're not really, there aren't that many of us, and it's going to be cold in the winter, so we want to be huddled close together for warmth. Fort Mandan only had two, I would say two and a half main uh, rooms that we made out of hewn logs. Remember, we're having to take axes and chop down trees and put them together in such a fashion that they can defend us uh, from any dangers of, of men or beasts as well as from the weather. And so these two rooms at Fort Mandan, I don't know exactly how big they were. They were perhaps, perhaps about 20 by 20, 20 feet by 20 feet. So not very big. Um, and the officers stayed in one of those, and all the rest of the men stayed in the other ones. And so we would build bunks, and they would all sleep there together. Um, they were not very big. They were not built for luxury or for comfort. They were built to keep us warm and keep us safe. Did you use something called an air rifle? Uh, someone has asked if we had something called an air rifle. Yes, we did. We, we, uh, when we were buying supplies for the expedition, we thought this would be 
a very handy thing. This is the absolute latest technology. So somehow, um, uh, some Italian, I believe his name was uh, Giordoni or something like that, had created uh, an, an air rifle. There's, instead of the stock where it goes against your, your, uh, your shoulder here, there's like a large metal tank and you would have to hook a, a hose up to that tank and he had a pump and you would have to pump and pump and pump and pump and pump and build up air pressure inside that tank. And then you would connect it to the rifle. And then there was a little uh, reservoir on the side that held a variety of small lead, lead bullets. I think it was perhaps 10 or 12. And it was very fascinating because you have to remember in our day, we have flintlock rifles. You have to load from the muzzle one at a time. When you fire it, there's a big flash, there's a big bang, there's lots of smoke. Uh, with the air rifle, you would, once the uh, reservoir was pumped up and filled with air, you would take it and you would insert one of the balls and you would go, and it would go, and that's it. And this ball would go and hit with, with a good amount of strength. And this was something that uh, Captain Lewis had gotten in case we run out of gunpowder so that we would still be able to hunt. But it was also a very effective tool to show the Indians again what, the, what our, our native friends would call big magic. Here is, here is a weapon that can shoot and perhaps even kill without making a noise, just like, the, just like the firearms that we have, only very silent and very quiet and very uh, not as visible. So those air rifles were certainly a very interesting thing. Uh, were you married at this point? Do you have any children? I, I am not married, nor do I have children, but coming back from this expedition, that is a situation that I hope to remedy very, very quickly. <laughs> were you ever attacked by uh, Native Americans? We were, yes. The question is, were we ever attacked by Native Americans? We were never directly attacked. Uh, they did not come towards us with the intent of killing us in broad daylight, but we did have several run-ins. Uh, initially, uh, some of the Teton Wasu up in the Missouri River, there was a misunderstanding again with horses and we think they had taken one of the horses that we had just traded for, and there was some question as to who had it. And I had gone amongst them to try to negotiate and get the horse or another horse back. And in return, they decided that they wanted some of our trade goods and some of our firearms from our kill boat. And so they initially start to come and, and climb onto the kill boat and take things. And to stop them, I brought my rifle up and aimed it at one of the the uh, Indians and then several of them aimed their weapons or pulled their bows and arrows and Captain Lewis is in the boat telling the men to aim their weapons and one of the small cannons on the boats he aims at the Indians and that was a very very tense situation but fortunately we were able to to back away and everyone was able to calm down and we were, we were able to get out of that with any, without any loss of blood. Um, a couple of other times uh, Native Americans would not attack us per se but they would try to, to steal our horses at night. And actually, uh, after Captain Lewis and I separated, I just had a situation just a few days ago where some, uh, we, we caught some uh, folks coming up trying to capture some of our horses, and we did get into a firefight, and we did have to shoot and kill a couple of them. Um, but that is, uh, to my knowledge, that's the only instance where we ever actually had to kill any of the, uh, any of the Indians Normally, all of our relations were very, very peaceful, fortunately. Um, how old was Sacagawea's baby when it was over, and what happened to them afterwards? Well, let's see. The baby was born oh, 04. So the baby now is, is not much more than a year old, uh, maybe not quite a year old. I know that they plan on going back to, uh, to near the, the Shoshone and the Hidatsa, uh, I don't know what's going to happen to them, but they have been incredibly useful to us. And when I get back um, to civilization, I'm going to do everything I can because I do have great regard for Sacagawea, and I've just remark it's um, it's remarkable that she was able to bring this child with us, and I almost fell in love with the child. And I'm going to make sure that he has a very good chance in an education, and I'm going to maintain contact as good as I can with Toussaint to see if I can't make that happen. Samantha wants to know, did you and Lewis ever argue? <laughs> Samantha would like to know if, if Captain Lewis and I ever argued. Um, 
maybe, occasionally, uh, not about anything big, but since uh, uh, Captain Lewis isn't here, I will tell you that there were some, there were some disagreements about how we should approach things. Uh, we generally had, and almost everything we talked about, we generally agreed on it, and what became frustrating for me was, you know, I, my jobs, as I said, are the logistics of the operation, the mapping, the hunting, and I'm out there every day overseeing the men, making sure that the expedition continues to move forward. And his main job is to do the, the scientific exploration and write in his journals and keep a record of what we're finding and how things go. And many, many nights around the fire, when I'm drawing my maps or making plans for the next day, Lewis wouldn't really be doing anything. He would just sort of be sitting there doodling in a journal and not really writing anything down. And there were days and days, days and days, sometimes weeks, where he didn't write a single thing in any of his journals. This was very frustrating to me. I wasn't sure why he would do this because this was the whole point that we're here. Um, and he also tended to sneak ahead if he wanted to discover something and be the first one there. He was the first one to, to make it to the Pacific Ocean. He had sent me on what I think may, may have been a, a wild goose chase so that he and his part of the party could see the Pacific Ocean first. But those were only a couple of instances. By and far, Captain Lewis is a very dear friend of mine. We could not have done uh, this expedition without each other. This, this expedition would not have been a success without both of us working together towards the same goal. And as far as serious arguments or serious fallings out, we have never had one of those. And I sincerely hope that we never do. How long have you been on the expedition at this point, And how long do you expect that to take? We never knew how long it would take. We knew it would take uh, a long time. Uh, we knew it would take years. So we, as I said, we began uh, in the spring of 1803 from St. Louis. Uh, we went up the Missouri River. We went uh, there at Fort Mandan from 1803 to 1804. From there, we headed west and eventually got to the Pacific Ocean. We wintered at Fort Clatsop along the Columbia River uh, but, uh, over the winter of 1804 and 1805. Um, and so now we are on our way back. Um, it's been now probably about two years and a few months. But again, I'm waiting here at the confluence and we're, we're, I'm at the Missouri River. So once the entire party gets here, we're able to load everything onto the boats. We'll be back in St. Louis, and, and uh, the expedition will officially end probably in no more than a couple of weeks. Uh, so I anticipate the entire expedition will have taken about two and a half years. Uh, did you bring boats with you or ever have any trouble with boats? We, we always had. The question is, did we ever have trouble with boats or did we bring any with us? Yes. Um, that's the unfortunate thing. Boats are by far the best way to move a lot of heavy stuff. And moving that heavy stuff in boats means you have to go along the waterways and where they're at. And as I said at the beginning, we were having to move up the Missouri River, not down with the flow of the water, but against the flow of the water. And the large kill boat had to literally be manhandled for miles and miles and miles upriver. We also had a couple of small sort of kit collapsible boats. Um, they were made of like metal hinges with wood pieces and the idea was that we would be able to find uh, hides. We'd be able to shoot animals, tan the hides, and the hides could be stretched over these frames and serve as smaller boats. So the boats were very, very important in the beginning and any time we needed to uh, cross a large body of water where we could not find a ford, we needed the boats. But those boats were very important in the beginning and of course coming down uh, the rivers we were able to go much, much faster. So those boats um, at different times of the expedition were absolutely crucial to us being able to move ourselves and our supplies in an efficient and safe manner. Several folks want to know what was the best part about the trip for you? People want to know what the best part of the trip was for me. I can't think of a, a single specific instance where I was overwhelmed and want to place that above any other. But I think a continuing theme for me personally on this expedition has been the joy, the awesome responsibility, the overawing feeling of being the first person on top of a mountain range or on top of a large hill or down in a beautiful valley with water that's as 
clean as you can imagine. And, and I'm just constantly reminded of the amazing nature of creation and seeing creation in some of the most beautiful and most raw forms that I think anyone ever will see it has continually inspired me on this expedition and made me realize that I am living the greatest adventure of my life and probably any other life of anyone because we've gone somewhere that no one has gone before and we're bringing back knowledge about that and I and I don't think anything is ever going to be any better than that with apologies to my future wife and children this has been a remarkable experience what was the hardest part about the trip for you I think the hardest part of the trip was um, some of the day-to-day -day business because there were many, many days where all we did was move supplies and move boats up and down rivers. That was the entire day. Sometimes there were weeks. We would wake up, we would fix our breakfast, we would break camp, put things in the boats, get ropes on the boats, and haul them up the river for 8, 10, 12 hours a day, stop, make camp, eat supper, go to bed, wake up and do that day after day after day after day. Um, I don't mind some adventure, I don't mind some excitement, but I cannot stand the monotony. Who was the first to get to the Pacific? The, like to see. Uh, the first person to get to the Pacific was Captain Lewis. Uh, he, had, he, took a, uh, he had asked me to map a particular part of the country that we were in, and he, he had heard from one of the, the Indians that the uh, large uh, Pacific Ocean was nearby. So he took a, a small group of men and just went west as fast as he could down the Columbia River, and lo and behold, he saw that. So he was the first one to see it. I did not come up for another few days. Um, what was it like to see that? Uh, on one hand, it was remarkable because here we were, the first white people to ever stand upon this part and look out and see the Pacific Ocean having crossed an entire continent. It was very awe-inspiring. And it was a great sense of accomplishment. And about 30 seconds after the, the sheer beauty and sense of accomplishment, I think Captain Lewis and I both turned around and looked at each other without saying a word, and we thought, well, now we have to go all the way back and carry all of our things and get these men safe back to the eastern part of the United States. So it was very, very, uh, a, it was a great sense of accomplishment, but it was also, wow, we're only halfway done. Can you tell us about your relationship with York? Ah, uh, yes, York. So York is uh, is my servant. He is a uh, an African slave. Um, he's not from Africa. He is of, of African descent, and uh, he has come along with me on this journey. I felt I needed someone who was strong. I needed someone who I could depend on. And during this journey, York has proved to be an incredibly valuable asset. He has uh, taken sort of an investment in the success of this expedition and he seems to have taken to it very well. The Native Americans find him fascinating because of the dark color of his skin. And York has become equals with everyone on the uh, on the expedition, including myself, and I feel that that's a remarkable thing. It's given him a sense of, of pride, it's given him a sense of belonging, and it's been very interesting to see the men on the expedition begin to look to York as one of their equals uh, because he has pulled and carried and fought and hunted along with everyone and contributed as much or more to the success of the expedition if th than anyone else. And so I think I have a great deal of respect for York now that I didn't have before uh, and so do the men and I hope that we'll be able to continue that respect. Do you know about how many species of plants you discovered? Sophia wants to uh, Sophia would like to know how many different plants we discovered. Sophia, I, I cannot give you uh, an exact number. That's more a question for Captain Lewis. It's, it's, it's at least 100, I would say, of, of plants that we'd never seen before, or at least that I had never seen before. You know, growing up in, in Virginia and, and, and in Kentucky, they're, they're, I became very, very familiar with the plants and the animals around where I grew up, and, and some of them were the same out west and some of them were very very different so I don't know how many exact species I suppose what we'll need to do is go back through our journals when we get back uh, and look at that because that's something I think we all need to keep in mind on this expedition is the expedition 
is the most fascinating part, but it's only the first part of this entire process. What we have to do now when we get back, after we perhaps get some clean clothes and a, and a good meal and some rest, is we have to sit down with all the artifacts that we've brought back. We have to sit down with all the maps and all the journals and all the notes, and we have to compile that information into a series of books that we publish because that's what the Enlightenment is. It's not just the getting of the information and the, and the process of learning. It's also the process of dissemination and making that information available to everyone. So we have to sit down and create as many books as it takes to get all this information out to the general public. That's what the Court of Discovery is really about. All right, I think we'll end with that today. Okay. Well, thank, uh, thank you so much for coming to our encampment here along the Missouri and Yellowstone Rivers. I'm William Clark. It has been a pleasure having you with us. I hope you will join us again soon. We have lots of different stories that we can tell. But until then, take care.